Um, I'm Lynn Piazic, Chair of Board of Education, and I'm going to call the February 27, 2023 meeting of the Woodbridge Board of Education to order at 7.08 p.m. with a reminder to all those watching and participating remotely to kindly mute their microphones in order to avoid background noise. This meeting, is, this meeting is being held electronically via WebEx and is being recorded. The recording will be available on our district website. I am going to um, take the roll call this evening. Uh, so board members, please unmute yourself um, and identify that you are here. Uh, Dr. Maria Madonic. Present. Ms. Sarah Beth Delpreet. Here. Dr. Jay Daya. Here. Ms. Brooke Hopkins. Present. Mr. Jeff Hughes. Here. Ms., uh, Dr. Michael Strambler. Here. Ms. Erin Williamson. Here. And we're waiting on Mr. Stephen Lawrence. As soon as we see him come in, um, I'll make sure to um, acknowledge him. Uh, staff in attendance this evening, Ms. Vonda Tenza, Superintendent, Ms. Donna Coonan, Director of Business Operations, uh, Director of Business and Operations, Ms. Carrie Borsherding, Director of Special Services, Ms. Annalisa Sherman, Principal, Mr. James Sapia, Assistant Principal, and Ms. Marcia DeGenero, Clerk of the Board. And I now see Mr. Stephen Lawrence has logged in. <laughs> Can you identify that you are here in present, Stephen? Stephen, can you hear us? Lynn, it doesn't appear his mic is on. Okay. You're muted, Stephen. If you can hear us. Can you give me like a high sign? Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No, no, we can, uh, we can hear you now. Network. Okay. Thank you. And and welcome. Um, I'm going to ask um, everyone to please uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Mr. Hughes, will you lead us in the pledge this evening? Yes. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation. under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. I realized I didn't put up the flag on the screen. Apologies. Um, correspondence. Sarah Beth, do we have any correspondence this evening? We do, and I believe everything is can be found in board book. Isn't that correct? Okay, yes. Any emails and letters that have been uh, received um, as board correspondence prior to 4 p.m. today have been posted in board book and are viewable by the public. Next on the agenda is public comment. The board welcomes public participation and is appreciative of the feedback we receive from the community, whether it is through letters or public comment at meetings. If you are making a public comment at tonight's meeting, please be aware that the board will not respond to any public comment at tonight's meeting. <clears throat> um, except to clarify issues. We will take into consideration your comments and when appropriate, 
district administration will follow up with you at a later point in time. We ask that speakers please limit their comments to three minutes. As in the past, Dr. Madonic and Mr. Hughes will serve as our timekeepers this evening. So I will ask that when the allotted three minutes is indicated that the speakers respectfully conclude their statements. If you have public comment to make, would you please raise your hand in the participants list? Mayor Elliker, I see your name, uh, your hand raised in the participants list. Please unmute yourself, identify yourself, and you can make your public comment. Hi, everyone. I'm Justin Elliker, a mayor of New Haven. Thank you for having me tonight. Uh, I'm here to share my deep concern about the Woodbridge Board of Education's decision to eliminate two of the 18 open choice seats available to New Haven children. I requested that this item be put on the agenda so we could talk a little bit more deeply about it, but I'm disappointed that your, your board declined to do so. Uh, in the limited time you've given us, our team will correct some of the misleading statements made by your board and leadership regarding New Haven and the open choice program. And our team will outline why what New Haven reimburses to Woodbridge is appropriate and reasonable. But I'd like to talk about the big picture here the goal of the Open Choice Program is to reduce racial, ethnic, and economic isolation. The program allows suburban districts to allow urban district students to attend their schools and vice versa. For some time, Woodbridge has opened spots for 18 New Haven students to attend Woodbridge Public Schools. New Haven has provided 2,648 suburban students with access to our schools through our Open Choice and Magnet programming. 10 of those students are from Woodbridge. Open Choice benefits New Haven kids and Woodbridge kids. They learn from each other and they grow together. In your meeting discussions and your letter to New Haven regarding this issue, you stated several reasons to justify your eliminating the two Open Choice seats. First, you stated that you have a concern that you have been receiving a disproportionate number of students with special needs. The Open Choice program is a lottery. Neither you nor I have any control over who applies. The idea as alluded to by the Woodbridge Board of Education, that anyone intentionally sends special needs students to your district is false and offensive. Your choice to continue this, discontinue this program because you have been receiving too many special needs students, I think is unethical and discriminatory. Second, in your letter to New Haven, you said that the alleged underpayment by the city of New Haven creates a financial burden that your district is not able to continue bearing. Our strong view is that we appropriately reimburse Woodbridge for costs associated with the program. But your claim that these two students are a financial burden on Woodbridge is shocking to me and clearly out of touch. Medium household income in Woodbridge is more than $171,000. Only 1.9% 1 of Woodbridge residents are living in poverty. Meanwhile, the median income, household income in New Haven is under $49,000 and nearly 25% of our residents are living in poverty. Are you really telling us that two New Haven students are creating a financial burden on your town? Finally, most importantly, this is about the children. The adults may come to different conclusions on what reasonable reimbursement might be. And because the adults have the, a disagreement, Woodbridge has chosen to end opportunities for New Haven students and Woodbridge students in the Woodbridge Schools District to experience one another, to be friends with each other, to learn from each other. For you to walk away from this opportunity is putting the adults before the kids and turning your back on equity. My understanding is that we've always been able to work this out in the past in the best interest of our kids. This is an opportunity for you to make a statement about the values of the Woodbridge people and the Woodbridge School District to show that you care about ending racial and ethnic isolation. Three You're minutes. Committed that you're committed to ending segregation and want to work together with your neighboring towns on this goal. You've done the opposite with your choice and I ask you to reconsider. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Elliker. Uh, next I see Tiffany Jackson, it's a hand raised in the participant list. Thank you uh, everyone for having me this evening. Uh, my name is Tiffany Jackson, and I'm the Executive Director of Student Services and Special Education for New Haven Public Schools. I, too, am here this evening to address commentary made in a recent board meeting related to open choice, more specifically billing uh, for students with disabilities. As mentioned, the promise of choice was to, and still continues to be, to reduce racial isolation. Unfortunately, Conversations about choice no longer revolve around integration and reducing racial isolation, but rather the cost to educate students given choice. 
Open Choice requires our district to pay the difference between reasonable cost to provide special education services. It has been stated that New Haven Public Schools doesn't pay for their students. This information is grossly inaccurate. We have and will continue to pay the difference between reasonable cost. Over the 2021-2022 school year, I, along with the superintendent, our, our superintendent, our finance director, met with Woodbridge superintendent, special education director, and finance director. We met to discuss and clarify concerns over cost. While I understand that we all have shrinking budgets and increased costs, we cannot engage in discriminatory practices that would preclude students with disability to have choice simply because of their disabilities. It is unfair to reduce the number of open choice slots available given the possibility of increased cost. New Haven Public Schools receive thousands of students through choice and magnet programs. Within this population of students, we receive some with very, very complex needs. We do not reduce or eliminate access for our students. We educate everyone. We provide choice and continue to uphold the promise of integration regardless of cost. We continue to encourage and urge you to do the same. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Uh, next, I see Michelle Bonanno. Yeah. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. That's correct. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is my time starting? Good evening, my name is Michelle Bonanno and I come before you this evening as the supervisor of magnet and grant programs for the New Haven Public Schools. I am here to set the record straight regarding allegations that the New Haven Public Schools do not pay our fair share for open choice special education services and that we direct special education students to apply out of district. The state statute regarding special education for open choice states, in the case of an out of district student who requires a special education and related services, the sending district shall pay the receiving district in an amount equal to the difference between the reasonable cost of providing such special education and related st services to that student. New Haven has paid the reasonable portion of our bill and we will continue to do so the same way we have done for over a decade with Woodbridge as our partner in open choice. To be clear, open choice placement is determined by a random lottery administered by the Area Cooperative Education Services, also known as ACES. The New Haven Public Schools has nothing to do with that lottery and we have no bearing on what choices parents make for their children's education. The application for open choice lottery does not include information regarding students' individual education programs and certainly does not consider any student specific education status when placing students as doing so would be unconstitutional. Additionally, it is my understanding that students are admitted to Woodbridge in kindergarten. In many cases, this would be prior to any special education identification. The state's open choice program is intended to improve academic achievement, re reduce racial eth and ethnic and economic isolation, and provide a choice of educational programs for public school students. This goal is not limited to students with spe special needs. It is appalling to me that the Woodbridge, Woodbridge Board of Education with would withdraw participation in a program that is rooted in the Brown versus Board of Education decision of 1954 because such participation also attracts students who may qualify for special education services. New Haven openly accepts 2,648 suburban students into our district. We are proud of over two decades of commitment to living out the intentions of Brown versus Board of Education and Chef versus O'Neill as a voluntary magnet school operator and participant in the Open Choice Program. We believe in equitable access to education for all students, regardless of their race, educational de designation, or zip code. We hope that you reconsider your decision to withdraw seats from the Open Choice Program in order to safeguard Woodbridge from educating urban special education students and join us in our mission to provide access to equal opportunities and successful outcomes for all students. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I see Daniel Delpreet's hand raised. Mr. Delpreet? Are you there? Trying to connect. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Oh. Hi, good evening, everybody. How are you? Um, just wanted to shed some light on this as a as a taxpayer in the in the town and everything else. I hear a lot of reasoning coming up and I would just like to speak on the logic uh, behind why I'm supporting stopping this program, not ending this program, but stopping. Um, the town of Woodbridge 
is is my town. It's where I pay my property taxes, and I know a lot of my property taxes go back to the state, and the state has reallocated a tremendous amount of money over the years to assist New Haven. That's why New Haven takes as many out of district children as they do because they took state money under John De Stefano and they rebuilt a lot of the schools. So when we look at this, this decision is a business decision that this board made, as it was explained to me. Uh, our taxes continue to go up and we do that for the education and for the school system. No one is saying we're turning our back on anybody. Our taxes are paid, our bills are paid. And we expect the same thing to come from our neighbors when they want to utilize our town. We'll be partners in this, but it's been a one-way street. And the education system, the community system, and the model of being a good neighbor is to have a two-way street. It looks like it's been a one-way street. Personally, I'm thankful the board stood up and took action to say that we're not going to continue to be a one-way street. There was thought, logic, and compassion put in by not just ending the program and removing students, but it's it's a pause. And I just hope everybody understands the reasoning behind it was it's a business decision as taxes and inflation continue to run away. Woodbridge is stepping up to say, hey, we have a fiscal responsibility to our community and not just continue to take on the burden of the expense of education. It should be a partnership as expected. And it's not as if we could appeal to the state to stop sending our funds into New Haven to continue that. And I just ask everyone to look at this from a business standpoint and the partnership to get into this together. It has been years that Woodbridge has not received the funding, but has continued to push the program. We're not ending the program in this town. We're just asking for the split to come back and for everyone to pay their fair share in what gets done. I just feel that's been avoided tonight and not mentioned, and we'd just like to get that on the record. That concludes my statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Delpreet. I'm going to scroll through once more to see if I have any hands raised. I don't see any. Maria, do you? I'm looking through now, Lynn, one more time. Um, I do not. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you who came to um, for public comment this evening. Moving on to the next agenda item, PTO update. Uh, a written report from PTO can be found in board book. I, en I encourage the public to access the report. I don't see Rushi here. I don't know if there's anyone else from PTO that have, might have anything else to add. Uh, Lynn, Rushi emailed earlier that she had a meeting conflict this evening and would not be in attendance. Thank you. So um, I will just reference uh, the PTO highlights um, in board book this evening and um, encourage all of you to do the same. I'm, I was excited to see some um, literacy uh, activities that the PTO is sponsoring with the school, the book swap, and uh, some guest speakers. So I encourage people to take a look at that. Thanks always to the PTO for their um, support and programming. Moving on to agenda item two, the minutes from uh, the consent agenda, the minutes from the January 4th special ed meeting and the January 17th regular Board of Education meeting are included in this evening's consent agenda, along with a budget narrative, a budget summary, the detailed financial report, and the combining financials. Does anyone on the board wish to extract anything from tonight's consent agenda for further discussion during the Finance Committee report? I don't see anyone, so may I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? Maria is making a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Correct. Thank you. Do I have a second to that motion? Brooke Hopkins is seconding that motion. Um, 
because we are meeting remotely, I need to uh, call the roll for uh, uh, all votes. Maria? Yes. Sarah Beth? Yes. Jay? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Aaron? <clears throat> yes. Yes. Mike? Yes. Stephen? I think I see you. I think I can yes. read your lips saying yes, Stephen. Thank you. I'm trying to figure out if I can actually get my voice. We got it. Great. Thank you. Brooke? Yes. And I vote yes, Marcia. That's a unanimous vote um, for accepting the consent agenda. Moving on to reports. Superintendent's report. Ms. Tenza. Okay. Um, Thank you all for being here virtually tonight so that we could be safe. Uh, I'm going to start with an update on the special education grant. I am very pleased to share that the Connecticut State Department of Education announced the recipients of their department's 23 through 25 ARPA school mental health workers grant, which will deploy ARPA funds to a small number of districts in Connecticut. This grant application process was extremely competitive. 92 districts submitted proposals and funding was awarded to 20 districts only. Woodbridge was one of these districts. And I'd like to personally thank and recognize um, our Director of Special Services, Carrie Borcharding, for her excellent work on this grant, which she wrote to fund a 1.0 full-time social worker for Beecher Road School. Currently, we do have 1.5 social workers and this position is currently funded in our ARP ESSER, which that grant is expiring in the spring of 23. So Carrie's work will actually help our district and town save money. For each of the first two years of the grant, we will receive up to $96,000 and the last year, 70% of that. These grant funds will free up monies from our ARP ESSER grant, which can then be allocated to other needs. And we're currently waiting on additional details from the state. The second thing I'd like to share is that last Friday was a, a big day for Beecher Road School in that we submitted our reading waiver to the state of Connecticut. And again, I do want to publicly thank a few people. This time I want to thank the members of the literacy team who were critical to this process. Tan Huntington, our multi-language learner teacher, literacy specialists, Teresa Nakuzi, Jennifer Nickel, Monique McDonald, and administrator Lisa Sherman, um, this team invested well over 100 hours of time to collaboratively develop the application, and we met every few weeks to discuss and review and move forward to best capture the strategies and practices that we have in place for Woodbridge. We now are waiting to see what the State Department will say. I do think it's important to share an excerpt of our cover letter from the waiver application so that you all can get a sense of where we feel we are at. So an excerpt includes, as Woodbridge's data and waiver application are reviewed, it will be clear that students are meeting with success in this district. Teachers know each student as an individual and work to meet each learner where they are in order to progress to their next level of learning. Administrators support professional learning around current research and literacy practices. Woodbridge has formally expressed written interest in joining the third cohort of the master class for the science of reading, and we are waiting for further information from the State Department of Education in that regard. We continue to work with consultants and current research to further develop our curriculum and strategies to help each and every learner in our district independently meet grade level literacy benchmarks. The data in our waiver evidences that this district is excelling in those efforts. At the same time, we do humbly recognize that until every single student is able to independently re read at grade level standards, no later than by the end of grade three, our collective work is not finished. Our quest continues to strengthen our teacher-student relationships and further our ongoing professional learning for an even deeper bag of research strategies to help every learner succeed. So we are pleased that we sent off our waiver. They sent me verification this morning that it was received. Um, so we'll keep you posted on that. 
I would like to provide a um, open choice update. Since the January 2023 board meeting's decision to pause filling the two available open choice spots for kindergarten next year and hold at maintaining our 16 open choice student spots, I've spent a great deal of time working with our Director of Business Service and Operations, Donna Coonan, to resolve related funding concerns. Monitoring how Woodbridge taxpayer monies are best spent to support education is one of our board's highest responsibilities. Equally important to our board is their advocacy of what is best for student learning. I wanna publicly reiterate Woodbridge Board of Education's commitment to the open choice mission and to our participation in the program. The resolution of this funding issue is one that should be addressed within the confines of the two school communities. It is the work of administration in both districts to resolve this, and this is the work we are currently addressing. An ideal resolution would be for the State Department of Education to provide clarification and guidance of how this law should be followed so that our district and other districts in Connecticut are not debating finances and competing to obtain needed funds to educate our learners. Regarding Woodbridge's most recent resolution efforts, on February 14th, we met virtually with stakeholders from Open Choice and the State Department of Education. Participating in this virtual meeting were Special Education Director for the Connecticut State Department of Education, Brian Klimkowitz, Open Choice Program Education Consultant, Janet Foster, Connecticut State Department of Education Staff Attorney, Matthew Venhorst, and Connecticut State Department of Education Chief Strategic Planning Officer, Keith Norton. At this meeting, Brian Klimkowitz stated that as he has done in the past with other districts facing this same issue, he is willing to serve as an intermediary with our two districts to help identify a fiscal resolution. Again, Central Office is addressing this and we will keep the board apprised. On a more positive note, um, notification was sent home to our school community Monday, informing everyone that as of March 1st, 2023, the state of Connecticut's funding of free lunch for each learner was reinstated by legislative advocacy until the end of this school year, June, 2023. This service is of great value to many families in our community, and we are pleased to share this news and hope that many families are able to take advantage of this assistance. I'm pleased to share that the Board of Education has prioritized a board retreat to be held the evenings of March 28th and 30th. CABE consultants Mary Broderick and Jack Reynolds will lead our board in an agenda designed to build our capacity to lead collaboratively articulate our aspirations for Woodbridge, establish board goals, define norms that support a high performing governance team that will advance the excellence of our district. And finally, this is going to crop up later on our agenda. Every six months from the inception of the coronavirus until September of 2023, each school district in Connecticut must update their safe return to school plan as a requirement to continue receiving the coronavirus relief federal grant funds. As a result, I reviewed the current plan Woodbridge has, built, has put in place since the fall of 2022. The plan that is currently in place is excellent and there are no changes to be made. All safety mitigation measures that are in place will continue for the remainder of this school year and through the summer programming. In September of 2023, I expect we will receive further guidance from the Connecticut State Department of Education. At this point, while nothing has been stated, I anticipate that the expectation from the Connecticut State Department that we update this document every six months will likely expire in the fall of 2023. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Vonda. Mm -hmm. um, are there any questions or comments from board members? Since we're virtual, um, I'm, I'm just going to call on everyone. If you have a question, um, unmute and, and you can, um, ask it, uh, Maria. Uh, thank you, Lynn. And, uh, thank you, Vonda. Um, I think it's important to note that all of my fellow board members here are committed to diversity and equity in education. Um, I had the honor of chairing our bipartisan policy committee this summer, and we drafted our equity policy, which this board unanimously passed uh, in August, codifying our commitments to high academic standards 
and to graduating lifelong learners and thinkers into a global society. Woodbridge is a very diverse community and I'm proud of that. We are not only ethnic, ethnically and racially diverse, but we are also economically diverse. And averages sometimes show extremes of polls, not necessarily those grouped around the median. Uh, greater than 92% of, of our tax base for our town is on residential, is coming from residential taxpayers. So we take respect for our taxpayers very seriously as we work very hard to educate the students of Woodbridge. Uh, voting to pause the open choice program was a financial decision um, and speaks to our commitment to our taxpayers. Our board has made efforts over the last 18 months to rectify our open choice finances. And thus far, we have not been presented with any type of reimbursement schedule or reimbursement rate from the city of New Haven. We are, however, honored that New Haven has reached out to us as a board. There are other towns in Connecticut that have already sunset their open choice program for these exact same financial reasons. Um, but the city of New Haven has reached out to us. And I think that that presents Woodbridge with a fantastic opportunity to serve as a model for finding a solution to this problem. Perhaps our continued work in coming up with a solution can be modeled to other towns and bring back those open choice programs in those other towns. So we've been presented with a great opportunity with this outreach, and I think that we should grab onto this opportunity and continue our conversations um, so that new, perhaps New Haven can take our resolution to those other towns to resurrect the program as well. So thank you very much to Carrie and Vonda and Donna and everyone who's been working so hard to put these numbers together and make sure everything has been accurate um, and to present our information. It's much appreciated. Thank you, Maria. Sarah Beth, anything? Um, no, thank you, Maria, for what you just said. That's what, what I think we'd all like to say, but you said it so beautifully. Um, the only question I have, and you might have already answered this, is how long do, is the typical response for the reading waiver? Like, by when would we know? Uh, actually, as of last time I heard fairly recently, they haven't even hired the people to read them. Does that, an, does that pretty much answer your question? Yes. Sarah? Yes, it does. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Jay, any questions or comments? Um, I just wanted to say congratulations on the ARPA funding for three years. Uh, Carrie, excellent job in putting all that data together. Donna, supporting that. And Vonda, pushing that through. So that's great to see the 96,000, is it, per year and then in the final year. You get what seventy percent of the ninety six thousand. Mm -hmm. About sixty seven. So, mm -hmm. so that's really, really good to hear that. Um, I'm presuming there's costs. Um, ex there are grants that are for specific purpose, and so I'm presuming these are for things like special education, uh, emotional support, etc. Am I right to assume that? It was written for a social worker. Oh, so it was written for one specific position. I'm sorry, I missed that. Okay, so it was written for the con continuation of one specific person. Okay. Okay, and I just wanted to reiterate what Maria said. I think the key here is to separate the two issues. The one issue of billing and the other issue of something that we're really committed to. Lisa's going to talk about this in her presentation, but something that we're very committed to in this community and I'd really like us to reconsider that decision with time. Hopefully we'll reach some resolution with respect to the billing side, but I would really like us to reconsider that decision as we go forward. Because I think for our community and uh, the information that was brought forward by New Haven, I think it's very important to consider their perspective, but I also understand our perspective on the billing. So hopefully we'll reach some resolution very soon and we'll get back to a, a good position and a good partnership that we've had for over 10 years, I believe. Yeah, actually, Jay, I, I think it's it's more than 10 years. It's just the specific name that it now has um, is probably 10 years old. But I, I think that um, our acceptance of students, I know many, many years we had um, students who came from New Haven. 
Um, we just didn't call it the open choice program, but there, there was a, a sharing of students. So um, I think we have a long history with New Haven. So thanks for mentioning that. Anything else, Jay? Jeff, anything? Uh, just a thank you to Carrie and the, and the administration for the hard work. That's awesome. That's a great win for Woodbridge. Um, I like to reiterate what Maria said, how uh, it's a financial decision from the board. So thank you, Maria. That was really well said. Um, I agree with everything you said. Um, I'm really glad New Haven uh, came to the table and decided to talk with us tonight. I'm just a little perplexed why it took a few years. We reached out a few times in the past. So I just want to point out that we did reach across the aisle um, in previous administrations. Uh, but I am happy that they finally came and talked to us. And that's it. Thanks, Jeff. Aaron? Nothing beyond what's already been said. Um, thank you, everybody. And yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Mike, any questions or comments? Um, just a comment. Um, just uh, I also want to reiterate what Maria said. Um, I think you said it very nicely, um, Maria. Um, our, we have a we have a demonstrated commitment to diversity in our in our district, um, and our record shows that. Um, and there's nothing we've communicated to New Haven that suggests that um, we um, lack any sophisticated understanding about disparities and diversity. Um, we've had many conversations about this, and we're a district that values um, our relationship with New Haven. And I'm also hopeful that we'll be able to revisit this and restart the open choice, rejoin the open choice program. Um, and so I, I just wanted to make that very clear that there was nothing in our communication to New Haven that suggested anything other than what we've communicated in that last meeting, what we're communicating right now. Um, at, frankly, I find it a bit insulting that um, we're being accused of um, lacking a value, lacking the value of diversity, lacking a value of diversity for our district and um, lacking in our interest in um, collaborating with New Haven. So I'm, I, I'm hoping that we can, in the future, clear up um, this misunderstanding with New Haven and that we can resume our participation in the open choice with New Haven. That's my hope. Mike, thank you so much. Stephen, any questions or comments? We can't hear you, Stephen. Can you hear me now? Yes. I don't get it. Anyway, uh, huge kudos to the administrative team at the school for just phenomenal work. Um, just, just so impressive. Enormous plus one to what Mike just said. I, you know, negotiations are productive when there's mutual respect. And I think we've really shown respect for the New Haven School District throughout this process. I don't necessarily feel we were particularly shown respect with the inflammatory language we heard this evening. And I find that, I find it both offensive and problematic at the, at, by the same token. We're showing our strong commitment to this program. It wasn't about the program. It's about being appropriately compensated as was set out by the state. So that's what this is about. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Brooke, any questions or comments? Up on the superintendent's report this evening? If you can hear me, my internet is funky. Can you we hear can. me? You yes. can? Okay, good. I still see Steve talking. Okay. Um, I want to thank, obviously, the administration for a wonderful job, and Maria, that was very eloquent. And Michael, thank you for bringing up that point. It did feel very insulting. We are not against diversity, and this was really a fiscal, uh, being fiscally responsible, which is where our decision came from. So. Thank you for saying that in more detail. Thank you, Brooke. All right.
Um, moving on to our Community Diversity Committee update. Lisa. Good evening. We can't hear you yet, Lisa. Okay. Sorry, I was I was just working out the sharing settings on WebEx and struggling, so I had to get out of that screen to get to unmute. So no oh. worries at all. I to you know I totally understand that. <laughs> Thank you, and I'm um, going to ask Mr. Billings, who is hopefully ready to go. There he goes. Thank you, Mr. Billings. I was just going to say, I'm going to ask him to share the presentation with all of you. So first, let me start by saying thank you so much for allowing me to speak to you tonight. Um, and I have to give a really large shout out to the Community Diversity Committee. Membership has changed throughout the years, but there is a um, core group of people who have been with the committee since its inception, and they have really helped um, move and shape and help us to grow um, professionally and really supported the work of this committee um, and, you know, the work of the district. So I really love this bulletin board. This was a bulletin board that greeted our students, um, I want to say, last year. And beyond the message that it entails, which to me captures all of what Beecher is about and, you know, really encompasses the heart of responsive classroom, which is all about knowing our students and building our classroom communities and coming together as a school community and just really enjoying and valuing everybody's differences. The background of this is actually made by our students and it was a lesson that our art department did around skin tones. So all of those different squares you see were students, they were learning art techniques of course about blending and shading and combining colors and how believe it or not to make a skin tone you might need to use the color green. But they were really having conversations about, about differences and about how we are all different. And um, they created these little squares and the squares were meant to mirror their skin tones. So it's a really beautiful message and it's even more beautiful with the artwork that you see behind it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our Community Diversity Committee during this presentation, and I'm also going to be talking about who we are as a school community. I'm not going to read those statistics to you. I know that you can all read them up on the screen or in board book, but I will let you know that I'll be diving a little bit deeper into our multilingual learners population, which currently makes up about 3.2%. Oh, I have to mention, too, that these statistics are from the 2021-2022 school year because that is what is our most recently released information on the State Department of Education website. So the information you're seeing is from 2021-2022 um, 2020 enrollment numbers. A little bit of information on the committee side of things. The committee was a strategic plan initiative from a previous superintendent, and it was initiated in the 2017-2018 school year. The membership has always included parents, staff members, and administration. And we meet regularly, and our, really our main goal is to support the mission of Beecher Road School, um, which, is, which is stated on the screen, but I'm going to read it because it's worth saying aloud, Beecher Road School is a caring, creative community that models and inspires the joy of lifelong learning, embraces diversity, and celebrates the unique qualities of each person. And that really is what our committee is all about and the work that we are doing um, as a group together to support our students and our staff and our larger community. So as I mentioned, I, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into our multi-language learners. We have a beautiful array of students in our building who speak all those languages that you see in those call-outs on the screen there. We do have 15 different countries represented at Beecher plus Puerto Rico. And I would be remiss if I did not mention our multi-language learner educator, Ms. Tun Huntington. She does an amazing job working with all of these students, working with teachers who support these students in the classroom, communicating with families and supporting them. I, I can't speak 
enough of all the good work that Ms. Huntington is doing every single day to support this unique population of students. Um, and I want to also mention that our teachers and our technology staff are all coming together to communicate, especially with our newcomer students. And in a few slides, you'll see one way that we are working on that. But our newcomer students come to Beecher speaking little to no English, and they are you know, put into a classroom and expected to grow and learn and take part in the educational opportunities that we offer at Beecher, which is, as I'm sure you can imagine, incredibly challenging. So a really, really big shout out to the teachers who are working with students who are newcomers and, you know, with all of our students and to Miss Tun Huntington to supporting this work as well. So this is the app that I was just mentioning that the technology department and Ms. Tun Huntington has found actually that Say Hi Translate app. It's available on student app, um, iPads and it's actually a really amazing app that allows you to communicate back and forth with a student who is a um, English language learner and especially a newcomer. So it's a really powerful tool that we use. I was actually in the office the other day just recently with a student and um, somebody who had not had an opportunity to utilize this app witnessed me communicating with a native Turkish speaking student and um, she was just so impressed with the fact that we were able to talk back and forth, even though um, our languages were so far apart in our understanding. So it's really an amazing opportunity. And, you know, again, thanks to the technology department and the um, and Miss Huntington. And I also want to point out this um, PTO sponsored field trip. It was an in-school field trip. That's the South Gym. Um, and we actually had, you know, Vito up there measuring to make sure that world would fit. And we had a lot of communication with the PTO and the organization bringing this um, amazing world in. But our all of our fifth and grade, sixth grade students got to engage in this in-school field trip, again, sponsored by the PTO. And they really got to explore the world in an amazing way. It was interactive. It was fun. They learned about different countries and cultures. There was some fun facts mixed in. It was incredibly interactive and just really cool. I mean, you walk into the South Gym and you see that big entire world sitting there and the kids were thoroughly interested in it. And the best part is they were together as a grade level community. So this is a little bit about what we do as both a district and as a school. Now, you know, I have to thank the Board of Education who did pass an equity and diversity policy just recently. And again, it's worth mentioning that one sentence from the equity and diversity policy that's really important is the inclusion, and I'm quoting now, the inclusion of all students and families supports district goals to increase student engagement and academic performance. Each child and member of the learning community deserves a respectful and affirming learning environment in which their background, identity, and ability is valued and contributes to successful academic outcomes. The responsibility for student success is shared by the Board of Education, district staff, students, families, and the community. I love that sentence. I think it sums up who we are as a school community and what the board and the district and the administration and the staff and the families all really believe in and commit to. I also want to mention that um, for several years now, we have attended a recruitment fair where we are seeking to recruit diverse candidates. We've changed our application process um, at the district level to include a question around diversity, equity, inclusion, both on our formal application process that's online and also in our questioning of staff. And we also have a newly developed strategic plan that we are working on. I know the board has received updates on that. And we do have a goal just around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's up there on the screen for all of you to see. As a school, we're going to dive into some of these initiatives that I'm mentioning here on this slide, but I do want to talk a little bit about our professional development opportunity, and I especially want to highlight a collaboration we had this year with Amity High School. We had members of the PLAID organization, students that came to speak to our learning community during a professional development day, and it was an amazing opportunity to hear directly from students 
some of whom were Beecher students, some of whom were not, about their experiences in the school system in the Boa region. They were open and honest and really spoke from their hearts. And I know that the entire staff walked away just feeling incredibly touched and um, inspired by their bravery, by their honesty, by what they were willing to share. Um, and it really helped all of us sort of come and grow a little bit as a learning community. The other PD that we did this year, the other professional development that I want to mention is we ran an ed camp style professional development. And essentially what that means, for those of you that are not familiar with it, is teachers and staff have the opportunity to offer mini courses that other staff then get to sign up for. And one of our ed camp offerings was a DEI roundtable where um, it was it was so popular, we actually had to offer a couple of different sessions. Um, and it was led by um, Larissa Crocco and Katie McCollum, two of our librarians. And it was an opportunity for our staff to sort of come together and discuss um, issues around DEI and talk about solutions, share resources. Um, it was Again, another really wonderful experience that helped a lot of our staff members engage in conversation. Um, and that was just this year. We actually have a PD day coming up in March where we will be doing more work around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in previous years, we've had learning and work around um, implicit bias. And we've done a voluntary book club that staff and parents actually did one also um, that where they were able to participate. Just a few highlights of professional development that we've done. In future slides coming up, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our school-wide experiences. So the very first thing that I want to talk about is our Empathy Week, which is uh, represented by the Ubuntu IMU book. We have, we transitioned our Read Across America Week into an Empathy Across America Week. So in addition to inviting outside guests in to read to our students, we do also have an entire week of themed activities around a particular text. And again, I have to give a huge shout out to the PTO that supports this work. Every year they purchase at least one book for every single classroom. Um, this was the book, the IMU book, was a book that was purchased um, last year. Um, we've also hosted and been able to do work around books by um, Jacqueline Woodson and... Um, I'm forgetting the other name. It's The Invisible Boy. So I'm forgetting the name of the author, but the name of the book is The Invisible Boy. Um, and I'm not going to ruin the surprise of this year's book, but this year the PTO was able to buy one book for every student. So every single student will be receiving this year's Empathy Week book, which is just amazing. Um, and the Empathy Week really has a lot of experiences with in the classroom and also within buddy classrooms. So younger students will partner up with older students. And there's always themes. So we have done work around being a newcomer and treating newcomers with kindness. The Ubuntu theme is we are one human family. And this year, the theme is going to be around immigration. There's also always an art project represented within this empathy week that usually supports the work of the week. So one year there was a portrait, which is the picture that you see up there as well, where students really took time to look deeply at their buddy partner and try to draw and sketch them out. And they asked them questions about their eye color, about what they like. And it was an interview and a portrait drawing session, which was particularly adorable with our younger grade students. Another art activity that we did as a school was a kindness chain, again, completed with buddy classrooms. And the students got to partner together and think about acts of kindness that they had done or that they wanted to do. And they made a beautiful rainbow chain. Other school-wide experiences, every Black History Month, we have shared literature experiences, usually tied with activities and lessons to go with it. So for example, um, last year, the students listened to a read aloud of a book about Misty Copeland, who is a very famous uh, Black, Black American dancer, and they got to watch a video of her dancing as a former dancer. I admittedly threw that one in. Um, they also got to... Um, 
um, read a book about Mae Jemison, who is an astronaut, and they designed a spaceship. They've heard and learned about musicians such as Trombone Shorty, who played for the Obamas at the White House. And this year, they're learning about Sonny Rollins. Um, and listening to some of his music. So that's just a sampling of some of the work they've done during Black History Month. This year, um, I'm really excited about our periodic table of Black History. It's a picture there that you see on the screen. And even better, you can't see, but every single one of those squares is a name of a current or past um, um, influencer on Black history. And, and because we wanted it to be more than just a name and their date of birth and date of death, I actually asked the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade students to participate in doing a little bit of research. And I told them this is meant to be completely independent. It's optional. You can do it if you don't want to. But almost every single one of those squares, if you lift the flap, you will be able to learn a little bit about the person underneath it. And I can tell you that um, the kindergarteners especially come in. This is located right outside the cafeteria. So all of the students of Beecher walk past it when they're getting into the cafeteria for lunch. And I will tell you that a lot of times I catch the kindergarten students and they're paused outside this beautiful display and the kindergarten teaching assistants or the kindergarten teachers are lifting up different flaps to read them to the students. So it's really fun to witness that. Other school-wide experiences, um, you, you know this already, I know many of you, but we also do shared literature experiences to celebrate different holidays and cultures. So this year, for example, we did a read aloud around Lunar New Year and another one around Diwali. Those are just a few examples that we have done throughout the year. And we also do um, announcements every morning. And during those announcements, we get to share fun facts. We get to share jokes. Sometimes I share problems. Proverbs, um, and the jokes are often student provided, by the way. Today, I had almost an entire class come in and share jokes with me. It's just a way that we bring our school community together. And then finally, the last community event I want to mention is around the activities that we do together as a whole school, because getting us together as a community, we're able to just celebrate one another and be together and enjoy, you know, the beautiful community that we are. And one such event is a Halloween parade. We actually, it's one of those things that came out of COVID years that is a beautiful thing that we continue. So during COVID, we started a Halloween march, the kindergarten friends hang out down south on the island outside and all of our students walk around. Um, and we also do community-wide walks. Some of you have been invited and seen that in action. Our kindergarten students do a superpower reading parade. That's actually coming up pretty soon where they march through the halls celebrating their reading and the entire school community cheers them on. And recently our third graders did some caroling where they went through the entire building. So I just love these opportunities where the community comes together and sort of celebrates one another. Diving in a little bit deeper um, across grades and departments, I would be remiss if I did not mention our amazing library staff. Our library technology department do a tremendous job of um, celebrating and honoring different cultures and different holidays. They do that not only in the lessons that they are teaching, but also in the displays that they have. And the one here around Hispanic Heritage Month barely captures the displays that they do. The library is often decorated. It's still right now decorated for Lunar New Year. Um, so the library is often decorated with um, books, with, with displays, with children's artwork all around um, holidays and cultures. Um, that really, again, brings our community together. Um, our world language teachers, of course, in incorporate learning about different Spanish-speaking countries into their curriculum um, all year long across all different grade levels. They are learning, obviously, about Spanish-speaking countries, about um, colors and numbers, and learning about um, Spanish. <laughs> Um, also grade level work. Our grade level, our grade levels do a lot of different work um, to incorporate diversity sort of into the fabric of the curriculum that we have. So 
we have, for example, in our reading workshop curriculum, a social issues book club in grade six. And the unit's primary objectives in grade six are really to um, allow our readers to have a broader context for identifying societal themes, power dynamics, and nuanced ideas that appear throughout literature. And that's work that our sixth grade students are ready for after engaging in reading workshop for so many years. And they spent a lot of time thinking about the character and the character's arc and the um, way that they move through a story. Grade two does a unit around community helpers. And I, I could keep going, but a lot of the work that we're doing is really embedded in the fabric of our daily um, curriculum and instruction. It's embedded in our read-alouds. It's embedded in our conversations that we have with our students. Um, and it's embedded even just in our school libraries, where our teachers are really working to diversify their texts, again, with a lot of support from the PTO. They're helping us a lot through PTO mini-grants to increase the diversity of our library. And it's just one more way that we are um, building our diverse libraries within our school classes. And I have to, of course, mention our art department. This is a, another display that is out, and I absolutely love it because it just, again, captures our beautiful uniqueness at Beecher. Um, the art department throughout the year celebrates every single child They're, through collaborative artworks, through individual products. They bring the students together. They celebrate everybody's uniqueness. And they manage to do all of that and still teach art techniques and art forms. And they also teach about different artists. And they contribute to a lot of our school-wide events. Um, not only do they do Arts Week, which I know everyone is aware of, but even just the um, Empathy Across America Week, they contribute to every year. So there's a lot that our art department is doing to support community and diversity within our school. Now, bringing it back to the committee, I spent a lot of time talking about the district and the school, but bringing it back to the committee, I need to talk about the work that the Community Diversity Committee has done. Um, we have participated in the townwide Woodbridge Like Me event. We're very fortunate that one of our Community Diversity Committee members is also a member of the townwide DEI. So there's a nice connection with the work that the town is doing. She regularly shares reports and updates with us from the town um, level and brings it back to us. Us, and we do some collaboration with the townwide events. And this was a good example. Um, so that picture was actually from this year's um, Woodbridge Like Me event. And both years we've managed to share books and provide a craft for a craft or an activity for the students to participate in. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a, a DEI townwide event also called um, Building a Diverse Library. And um, I was actually super excited because I got to participate in that and I collaborated with Miss um, Crocco, the librarian um, at the time and we were able to sort of work together to prepare for that event. We have sent community-wide letters when there has been a specific need. We've also um, done a survey for parents, students, and staff. That just started last year, and we are right in the middle of it now for students in grades five and six and for staff and for parents. We're literally in the middle of doing that right now. Um, I mentioned the optional book clubs that we have done, and I have to say that the committee serves as a resource to sort of talk about any D. EI issues within the school or within the community. Anything that comes up, they're available as a resource and as a sounding board and as a group of people that can sort of come together and talk openly and support one another. So that is one of their biggest strengths, I think, as a committee and really supports, again, the work of the school that we're doing. And because I love starting and ending and putting pictures in anytime I can, um, this is a picture of our students um, creating a heart. Again, this was tied to a Empathy Across America lesson. Um, and they were, again, talking a lot about kindness toward one another. They were talking about differences and they put all of their hands in the middle and took a beautiful picture of all of their different hands. That's the end of my presentation, and it apologies that I talked so much, but there's so much good work happening that it's hard not to share it all. Um, but I would be welcome to answer any questions that you might have. Lisa, thank you so much. 
Um, I'm going to try it this way this time. If you are a board member and have a question or comment to make to Lisa, could you raise your hand using that little hand emoji and then I'll call on you? Jay, well done. You're on. Lisa, I just wanted to say thank you very much to you, uh, to the administration, to, I see Kerry there, uh, Jimmy's there, and the teachers and the librarians especially for all the great work, the art group. I think it takes a community effort here, and I think we do a great job in celebrating what we have in our school, which is an inclusive community. So thank you so much for making that happen and your enthusiasm. I think it really, really gets everyone else going too. And I think that's wonderful. Thank, thank you, Lisa you. and the team. Thank you. Jay, thank you. I, I couldn't have said that better. So thanks. Erin, I think I saw your hand as well. Yeah, I just wanted to echo what Jay said. I thought that that was a great presentation, super informative, really helpful. Um, yeah, it just, it was really nice to see all of the work that Beecher is doing. and. Um, and yeah, just really nice to see that Beecher is creating a, a wonderful place for everybody um, who walks through the doors. So thank you for all of your work, both on the presentation and to make that community possible within the school. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Maria? Uh, thank you, Lynn. I, I just want to echo the sentiments of, of Jay and Erin as well. And, and thank you, Lisa, and all of our um, administrators and all of our teachers who carry out this work. Um, Lisa, in your presentation, your enthusiasm is contagious and the warmth is contagious and it speaks to how people feel when they walk in our building. So thank you for giving us an insight to that at the meeting today. We've definitely felt the warmth. Thank you. So Lisa, you can tell um, we were delighted with your presentation and I thank you for the hard work that you do. I see you, Mike, I'll get you, um, that you do every day. Jimmy, for the work you do every day. Carrie, for the work you do every day. I mean, our administrative team is amazing. Um, Anthony, I want to thank you for, for being our tech guy and getting um, that all those slides up. Thanks yes. for that good work. <laughs> we, we think you're amazing too. Um, but Lisa, it's one thing that I want to point out is that you and Jimmy and 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 all of the staff at the school, it's not just, it's from the top down, the custodians, the cafeterias, they're all, they embrace the kids and, um, and what you just spoke about. And I really appreciate that. So I thank you. Um, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I just wanted to echo, um, actually, echo some of the comments that have already been made and ask one question. Um, and I also appreciate um, all the effort that's been made to create an environment within our school that is welcoming and inclusive and um, appreciates um, difference. Um, I, it, it's very palpable. It's, um, you can tell from um, Lisa's excitement in the um, presentation today, I agree that it's an infectious um, excitement that she has um, and is very genuine. So I really just wanted to express my appreciation um, for all that um, you and the rest of the staff have been doing, um, uh, all the things you've been doing. Um, and the question is, um, I think one of the things that can be really challenging for not just kids, but adults, is um, when you have um, differences in perspectives, uh, when you're encountering differences in perspectives in such a way that it um, um, challenges you to um, be open to hearing another person's point of view um, and actually considering uh, that, that point of view. Um, and I, I'm wondering you know, to, to what degree we as a school are 
trying to foster those kinds of actual skills in, in students. So, so there's, I think there's like, I see this as kind of the two parts to um, these efforts around diversity. One is the, you know, the efforts around building the community and appreciating diversity. And another component has to do with you know, developing important skills for communicating and, um, and relating across difference. And so I'm I'm wondering if you could speak to that, like what what are the skills that we're hoping students will develop in this regard, and what are we doing to help promote some of those skills? That's a really great question, and you know one of the best things there's so many great things about working with children, but one of the best things is that they are still. Um, they're they're so honest, right? I mean, they will they will just tell you what they're thinking or what they're feeling, and um, and that's a beautiful thing. And so it's also a challenging thing because sometimes you do have to navigate what that looks like and what that sounds like. And and those words that I just used, what does it look like and what does it sound like, is actually language that we use within our classrooms, and it's very responsive classroom language. Um, so, for example. Um, I'm thinking even about when they're having a conversation about a math problem and one student solves it one way and another student gets a different answer. And there might be a conversation around instead of you're wrong or I'm right or you're stupid or something like that, which it could derail into, right? The teachers teach into what do you do when you disagree with somebody? How do you say, I think this, you know, how do you use those I statements? So I think a lot of that work is actually embedded in um, the work that we're doing naturally in reading and writing and math and social studies and science. And how do you disagree respectfully? How do you have partner conversations? How do you tell somebody who expresses an opinion that's different from yours that's your opinion. This is my opinion. You know, where do we go from here? Um, and I would say it also happens like even out on the playground, you know, like you're fighting over a ball and um, and how do we resolve that disagreement? So I think a lot of that happens organically with kids and um, and teachers work. That's where, again, responsive classroom comes in because it's about creating that class community. It's about having those problem solving conversations. Um, it's about respecting the dignity and the viewpoints of each kid and allowing them to share them, but also having them have conversations together. Um, and sometimes it doesn't go well, you know, and those are usually the kids that end up in our office. And um, Jimmy and I talk to them. We're we're both big believers in restorative conversations and we're big believers in um, helping students grow. We're big believers in progressive discipline. Um, so a kindergarten student conversation looks different than a sixth grade student conversation, um, but it's always about um, let's talk about what happened. Let's talk about how we talk about it. And also let's talk about fixing it um, when any student is sent to the office. Um, so, you know, I don't know if I answered your question clearly, but I, I think that a lot of what you're asking is really happening organically within the classroom and with students. And, and we do teach explicitly into having disagreements and talking through them. Um, across the whole entire day because they happen all the time um, with kids and they have to think about and talk about them with one another and with their teachers. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more raised hands, Lisa. So thank you again and we'll move on to uh, your update. So you're on again. You got a lot of air time tonight. Thank you. Um, so I, I actually was trying to shorten my updates. I felt like I was talked a lot just now, but I have a couple of things to share with you. Um, as Vonda mentioned at the beginning, um, our the state um, we did some, submit our waiver to the state for our literacy curriculum, and that is a huge moment of celebration. And I also have to give a shout out to our literacy team, Ton Huntington, Monique McDonald, Teresa Nacuzzi, and Jen Nickel. They really worked tirelessly um, to support this 
waiver and to get this work done. I also have to give a personal shout out to Mr. Billings. He helped me a lot with the data piece that I was working on. Um, and I have to say that working through that waiver and having those conversations with the literacy team and with Vonda allowed us to really think about some of the great work that we do at Beecher Road School. There's always room for growth. I'm not going to say that there isn't because, of course, there is. But two of the things that really um, two critical areas of literacy that really stood out was the um, opportunity for workshop teaching, which allows all of our students to have voice and choice in what they are reading and what they are writing, and the beautiful differentiation that happens based on individual student progress and interests. So that is an area that really came out during this waiver process as a shining light at Beecher and something that really speaks to our strengths as teachers and learners of literacy. Another area of strength for us was our intervention, which really occurs consistently based on data. Students are receiving intervention services from our literacy coaches, and it is really targeted to their very specific needs. And the great thing about looking at this data that we had to look at was we were able to really go through and talk about the students and their needs and and pretty much every single student that we were identifying using through this waiver process um, was students that we already are working with in our intervention process. So it felt really good to validate the data work that we do and the way that we identify and support our students. I also want to talk a little bit about just reading in general. Today, I had the honor of having an administrative intern shadow me for the day, and he was, first of all, blown away by how little kindergarten students were because he is an eighth grade teacher and, and is used to big kids. So he thought those little kindergarten friends were pretty much the cutest thing ever. Uh, and he also got to see everything from kindergarten to sixth grade. And at the end of the day, we were in a sixth grade classroom. And, and this just brings to light exactly what I'm talking about, about our work around literature. There was some sixth grade students reading a Jason Reynolds book, who is one of my new favorite authors. I love him. And I got very excited because it's a book that I hadn't read. And all of a sudden, I had a group of sixth grade um, boys talking to me about this book. They were giving me an entire summary of the book that one of them was reading and then a second. Another one had the second one in the book in the series, and a, and a third was being read aloud by another student. And I had all of these boys, and they were summarizing the book. And then they were like, "No, that's not what happened." And they were talking back and forth and talking over each other. And it was it was just amazing and like such a credit to the work that we do because they couldn't wait. And I actually got a, a radio call in the middle of this conversation, and I I I want to believe. I might be wrong about this, but I want to believe that they were a little bit disappointed that I had to leave the conversation. That's what I'm going to go with. I, so I just I have to sort of credit the, the work that we're doing, all of our teachers, all of our paraprofessionals to support literature instruction every day. Again, we have room to grow, but there's beautiful things happening. I also have to mention that we had a fire drill today, and I, I need to, again, give a shout out to our staff and our especially our North Office staff and um Fire Marshal Joe Capucci was on site, and it's wonderful to have that partnership with the Woodbridge Fire Department. And we were very successful with our fire drill. Our building was clear. All of our students were accounted for and our staff were accounted for. So we're very excited that we continue to just be successful in practicing our safety procedures. Mr. Sapia and Ms. Borchardang and I are in the middle of our mid-year meetings with teachers. As you know, as a Board of Education, we do meet with teachers all the time, but targeted around their goals three times a year. And we are in our mid-year goal meeting meetings goal meetings. And those conversations have just been wonderful to connect with our teachers, to learn about all the good work happening, and to talk a little bit about the struggles and, and what they need support in. So those meetings have been really productive and fun. I have to give a quick update on technology because I have recently seen some amazing things happening. Our kindergarten students are using a device called an Osmo. It works with an iPad and they today were building numbers using different dot tiles and popping bubbles and making little goldfish swim and basically doing addition, multi-digit addition um, without even realizing they were doing that. So that was just amazing. 
amazing. And then I also was in another kindergarten classroom and I saw them wearing adorable paper hats because only a five-year-old can wear a paper hat and just think it's the best thing in the world. And I asked them because it had a bunch of zeros and ones on it. And I was like, what's your hat about? Is it about coding? Did you do coding? And they were so excited to tell me that they completed a hands-on robotics intro to coding That wasn't quite the language they used, but I did get clarification from our technology department, but they did complete a hands-on robotics intro to coding unit, and so they celebrated with these paper hats, and they're moving on to some more coding um, using 2D models, so just really cool work happening in technology. And then my 092 intern and I were in a fifth grade classroom, and they were gifted. I gave them a class pet, and before anybody thinks I violated any policies. The class pet is in fact a um, stuffed burger turtle. It's a turtle in a hamburger. It's It's very fun for fifth graders, trust me. And they actually decided to make a movie about this class pet. Now they were given this class pet, I think back in October, um, and it continues to be a part of their classroom community. And now they are making an entire movie that many of them are starring in. And this is independent work that they're doing using their iPads. So it's really cool, the technology stuff that's happening at Beecher, some of it completely independent. One last update, Um, I'd be remiss, and I I don't do this often enough, but I have to give a really, really big shout out to our paraprofessionals. Um, Today, the big talk, of course, around the building was whether or not we would have a snow day. And I had the opportunity to talk to a lot of our paraprofessionals and a lot of our staff members, not just about the snow day, but about other things as well. And, And I was thinking as I was walking away from one particular conversation, laughing about predictions and whether or not we wanted to jinx it or not jinx it. I was laughing about it because it's such a warm community and our paraprofessionals do an amazing job supporting our students and they show up every day. They're outside doing bus dismissal and arrival duty every single day. They're with our kids all the time. They are working in classrooms. They are working in resource rooms. They jump in the cafeteria when they need to. I visited the cafeteria today and There was um, several paraprofessionals there sitting next to students, helping students open containers. And I just, I don't do it enough, but I need to publicly thank our paraprofessionals for everything they do every single day, often with a smile on their face. And they're just amazing. Um, They really are. And I just needed to mention that because I definitely don't do it enough. So that's it for me, unless there's questions. Great. Lisa, thank you. That was Wonderful tonight. Um, lots of information. And I agree with you about our paras, uh, another amazing group of people who support our kids and the school every single day. So um, thanks for that shout out to them. I'm going to do the same thing. If the board member has a question or a comment about something in Lisa's report, do the emoji hand. Or just wave like Mike did. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Mike did the emoji hand and waved because he was like, I think Lynn's missed that I raised my emoji hand. <laughs> um, thanks, Lisa. Okay, I think we're ready to move on. Uh, 3B, Town Building Committee for Beecher Road School Capital Projects Update. Jeff Hughes, you're on. Yes, thank you. Um, The building committee met last week in executive session. Uh, Thank you, Vonda, for putting a team together of subject matter experts, yourself included. Um, I think it went very well. A good discussion on security. Uh, The building committee meets March 10th at 8.30, um, and hopefully we'll be one step closer to uh, submitting an RFP. So slow and steady wins the race, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Anyone have a question for Jeff? Okay. Um, Moving on to 3C, Curriculum Committee Report. Mike? Yep. So we met on February 2nd, and on the agenda we had um, two things. One was an update on the reading waiver, which we heard about earlier today. And then the second uh, had to do with um, specials. We um, reviewed 
um, the curricula for each one of the specials we had, which included PE and health, um, music, world language, library, and art. Um, it was really interesting to hear about the uh, curriculum associated with each one of these specials and to learn about um, the professional development that occurs for each one of them as well, what kind of standards um, exist and how we're updating those standards. Um, we will be, um, we also talked a little bit about wanting to cycle through um, as a curriculum committee, the various um, subjects that we're covering across all of our grade levels. So that will be a focus of um, some of our future discussions. Thanks, Mike. Anyone have a question for Mike? Okay. Uh, Finance Committee report. Stephen. Hmm, we can't hear you, Stephen. Sometimes it's if I unmute my computer, sometimes if it's I, I, I unmute my phone. I'm not sure which. <laughs> um, that we got you said, now. okay, this is great. So, uh, th this report is with absolute full credit to Donna, uh, who's doing an amazing job of, uh, of crediting our finances. And, uh, and of course, I've just been receiving tremendous support from my fellow committee member, Sarah Beth, um, as well as Lynn and Maria and Vonda in my, in my learning curve in this new role as chair. So that said, uh, what we ultimately want to end up with is we're proposing two budget transfers tonight. Um, but before we get to that, I'll just give you some of the, the top line takeaways. Uh, first off, you know, in the plus column, the district continues to have significant salary savings, about 300000 this year to date. And, of course, as we've talked about, this is due to staff turnover last summer of several teachers and administrator positions and also consistent vacancies in our paraeducator positions. And as we've noted, this is a nationwide challenge, the paraeducator shortage. Uh, also in the plus column is the fact that the winter has, other than today, uh, has been fairly kind to us temperature-wise. Um, so it's looking like we're, we're now projecting the heating costs are going to stay on budget, which we can all hope that works for the school and for all of our households. On the cost side, other purchase services are running about $120,000 over. Uh, we've talked about this a number of times. This is due to uh, outplaced tradition, uh, tuition, I can't speak, and additional transportation costs. However, we do expect to get an additional appropriation ultimately from the town to cover this when our excess cost funds come in. Finally, our professional services are running about 80000 over, and this is due to the change in model where we're using substitutes rather than interns to backfill teachers' PTO days. So the bottom line is, as of January 31st, we're projecting an $86,000 surplus for the year. All right, so that's sort of the, the big picture. In terms of the, the two budget transfers proposed, I mean, basically, at the, the rationale is that rather than wait till the end of the fiscal year to do reallocations to cover line items where we may be higher in some things, lower in others, because we're in a strong enough position and Donna can sort of forecast as clearly as, as possible at this point, there's an opportunity to begin to address some of those um, funds, some of those changes. So basically, the as you've seen in your in the in the board packet, uh, the budget transfers are to decrease non-certified salaries by seventy six thousand six hundred and sixty dollars, uh, and to use the salary savings from those vacant positions to allot seventy thousand dollars to two registered behavioral technicians, and sixty six hundred and sixty dollars toward the per purchase of two chairs. Um, for adapt adaptable seating required by an IEP. So that's really, that's the, that's the overview. Um, I would say, are there questions, comments? Um, I'm going to ask Donna, did you want to add anything to that? Or I think 
it's pretty clear, but yeah, and just that the board policy states that if we uh, want to do a transfer more than five thousand dollars, that we come to the board with it. And um, Carrie noticed that she needed to purchase some special ed equipment that was above her, um, her budget. And I was just thinking, you know, while we're at it, every time I do these monthly reports, I'm trying to remember that, you know, we're going to pay for these technicians, but we really have savings here. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll just move that budget if it's if it's okay with everyone and stop having to mentally do it in my head when I'm preparing the reports. And so. Perfect. Okay. Board members, any questions or of Stephen, Donna, anybody? Go ahead, Erin. Um. So I think that all sounds great. I would just note that in the policy committee meeting, we also noted that if we did have the revenue, we might want to have Cabe do a review of our policies again, because it had been a while. And so I don't know when we do this transfer, um, I wasn't following all the numbers, if we still end up with any excess. But if it does look like we are going to have some excess, that might be another thing we want to just consider. Um because I do think that it has been a long time since we have had a really robust review of our policies. And I think we would benefit from having um, them reviewed. So just bringing from one committee back to another thing so that we can have that cross um, communication, um, that that might be someplace else that we want to look at investing in this year. If we sure. the yeah, these transfers will be net neutral, you know, one's a debit, one's a credit. So um, I think, you know, after we get through through March, another month, we'll just have one quarter to go. And it would be a, a good time to start maybe compiling, um, you know, things that we we could possibly do should should these savings, you know, prove out. Uh, yeah, I think that would be a great way to invest the money because it's kind of our future and it's investing in the policies that know, we all rely on as, as um, an entity. So I'm sure there's other places as well um, that we could think of in terms of security, in terms of other things as well. But just um, it's we're, that's a fortunate position to be in. I know it's not necessarily one we anticipated, um, but I, if we have needs that can be met by them, I would love to see us be proactive in trying to get some of those needs met. Yeah. And the um, the new grant with the social worker is going to help because that social worker is going to be able to come out of a grant that then can be reprogrammed to hopefully help with the security and, and you know, other items like that. Great. Jay, did I see your hand raised? Go ahead. I just had two very um, quick questions. Good job, Stephen. Excellent presentation. Uh, Donna, I had a quick question, Stephen. So what I noticed is you've got a big savings on the teachers on the 100 series. Uh, but I saw the seamers go up significantly. So that seemed to be an anomaly to me because when you're bringing in younger teachers in, older teachers are retiring, the salary scale changes a little bit. I would have expected seamers to go down unless I'm missing something. Is it that we didn't forecast it as high as the increase that was put forward, or was there something else that I'm missing here? Um, well, I'll I'll say two things. the The seamers is not for teachers; it's for the non certified staff. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily relate. But within the thousand series, I agree with you because the um, we keep saying how we are not full with our paras and, and yet our, our seamers line is, is, you know, I would expect we'd have more savings there. So I don't have the exact details behind what went into that number in the current year's budget, but I suspect maybe there was like an addition of 10 paras or something last year. Maybe some of that didn't make it into the bottom line, the, the, the MERS for them. Um, but um, all things considered, if we, if, if, I mean, we are still trying to hire those positions, but, you know, hey, we're getting going to be to the last quarter pretty soon. Um, I, I don't think we, we will um, certainly, you know, it'll work in our favor that we have these vacancies because it's going to allow us to not be so over in that line. 
and quickly related to that, you just raised the other point I was going to ask on. So I think you're thinking just like me here. So the second thing that I saw here is that the special education powers is 130,000 over budget. Um, so I'm a little worried. Was there any substitution from the regular powers to the special education? Because I know those are needed by state law and the others we can sort of borrow from. So I wanted to see if that happened here too. So the paras are under budget. We we have savings there. And, and regardless of where somebody is coded within the budget, if the vacancy is in for a para that is required by an IEP, they're going to get pulled. And, you know, we probably should not take a good look at maybe at the end of the year and just make sure if we need to do any reclassing between the, the regular ed and special ed line so that we have good, you know, just data for ourselves of where we've spent that money. But, um, you know, it kind of is, you know, staff kind of is, the administration is free to move those staff between those assignments as needed. Yeah, I just have a concern because I think one of our big mandates in the budgets in prior years has been to fund the powers. And I know they're hard to get. But I think one of the things that we'd seen in the past was that the general ed were moved to the uh, special education, which, again, if there's a legal mandate there, we need to do that if they're not available. So I just wanted to see what the numbers were on the general education from previous years to see what we're looking at these days. And I know they're hard to get. I get that part. I just wanted to see, uh, you know, how low we are on that side for general education, because I know the teachers really appreciate the support in the classroom with the paras. And okay. so I just wanted to see where we are with general ed on that side. I'm not sure if Carrie or, or, or Annalisa or somebody can say how the, how the staffing is right now between the lines. It's okay. I'm not going to put anybody on the spot here. Thank I mean, you. You I don't have the, me. I don't have specific numbers, but I can tell you, yes, you're correct. It's uh, really difficult to staff everywhere right now. So we have had to pull individuals. We're trying to get creative about other ways um, because it doesn't look like that staffing is, uh, issue is going to change anytime soon. So how we can best support students working around that. Um and of course, I know general education teachers want to have everyone in their class. Um, we are moving everyone around as often as we need to in order to make sure that we're fully covering all the service hours that are required. Um, but that was also why we hired those two RBT, uh, BT, RBT positions, um, because we had been open for so long um, in order to help fill that need. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Donna. That's excellent. All set, Jay? Great. Anyone else? So we did this a little backwards. Um, usually we have the motion in the second, then the discussion. But um, Stephen, do you want to make that motion or do you want me to? Uh, if you want to make it, I would be fine with that. Okay. I'll move that we approve the line item transfers in the 2022-2023 operating budget as presented by the administration. Is there a second, Stephen? Yes, Stephen indeed. seconding that. Um, okay, let me call the roll. That's a different piece of paper for the vote. Um, Maria? Is that yes. Sarah Beth? Yes. Jay? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Mike? Yes. Steve? Yes. Brooke? Yes. And I vote yes. It's unanimous, Marcia. Thank you so much, everyone. And um, Donna and Stephen, thank you. And Carrie, thank you for your... Uh, information on on that. Uh, moving on to policy committee report, Maria. 
Uh, thank you, Lynn. The policy committee had a working meeting on February 7th. Um, over the last year, uh, the policy committee has worked to update uh, many of our policies based on changes in Connecticut general statutes. But we are almost at the 10-year uh, mark uh, since the last comprehensive review of our policies. Um, so we're going to begin taking up that work. Um, we're going to start with the 9000 series, which are the board policies themselves. Um, and then, you know, as Aaron mentioned before, we're going to look into going through the other series as well and looking for some guidance from CAVE in that work um, also. Um, our next meeting will be April uh, 5th. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Anyone have any questions on the policy committee report? Okay, I don't see any hands on that. Um, next is Cable Liaison Report. Maria or Sarah Beth or both of you. Um, I can give a little update uh, on that. We have upcoming on uh, Wednesday, March 8th, uh, Cape Lobby Day on the Hill. Um, the last issue of the Cape Journal came out uh, this past month, and uh, there are four new uh, webinar series uh, in, open to everyone for free in the library, if anyone wishes. Thanks, Maria. Um, Vonda... And Donna and I um, attended the webinar on the governor's budget briefing, and I believe that is now in the CABE library. If it isn't, I have a link to it if anyone's interested in seeing that. Um, okay, new business. Um, first thing on the agenda for new business is revising the ad hoc committee membership. So you will find in board book an outline of the composition and charge for the enrollment, instructional needs, and space planning ad hoc committee that the board approved last month. Uh, in reviewing board policy 9133, because that's what we're doing now is reviewing policies, um, I've noted that the chair of the board serves as an ex officio member of each committee. So considering that our board committees historically function with three board of education members and the chair as the ex officio member, I am going to recommend that the membership of the enrollment instructional needs and space planning ad hoc committee be modified to include three board of education members rather than the two that are listed on the original charge and with the, with the chair serving in an ex officio capacity. So I am going to um, make a motion uh, to modify the membership of the Ad Hoc Enrollment, Instructional Needs, and Space Planning Committee to include three Board of Ed members instead of two. Do I have a second to that motion, Jeff? I'll second that. Thank you. Is there any discussion on that motion? can raise your hand, emoji, you can wave at me, whatever you, works for you. Okay, I see no discussion, so I will call the roll for um, that motion. Maria? Yes. Sarah Beth? Yes. Jay? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Mike? Yes. Stephen? Yes. Brooke? Yes. And I vote yes. That's also unanimous, Marcia. Thank you all um, for, for indulging me in that error that I made. I, I never created an ad hoc committee before, so <laughs> that was my first attempt, and now I know that. Now I've learned, and uh, if I have to do it again, I'll do a better job. Um, we're moving on to approving the uh, safe return plan update. Vaughn, did you have anything you want to say? I know you spoke about that in your superintendent's report, but um, do you have anything you want to add? I, I really don't. I tweaked maybe three or four words and dates for semantics. I really didn't change anything. It was comprehensive and thorough and accurate. And um, board that was included in board book. So it looked... Uh, 
looked fine to me, looked like it was pretty much what we were, were doing in the school. So I'll make um, a motion to accept the February 22nd, 2023 safe return to in-person instruction and continuity of services plan as presented by the administration. Do I have a second to that, Maria? Any discussion on the safe return plan? It was so, I, I mean, Vonda, I have to say, I think it was so much easier than I remember when we were first going back to school, all that it entailed and the hard work the administration, Lisa's shaking her head, the hard work the administrators, um, Lisa especially, did to make that all happen. So, um I see a light at the end of the tunnel. Well done. Um, so I'll call now for the vote. Maria? Yes. Sarah Beth? Yes. Jay? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Mike? Yes. Stephen? Yes. Brooke? Yes. And I vote yes. And so, Vonda, that can be submitted. It's unanimous, Marcia. Thank you all. And Vonda, thank you for your work on that. Um, it's time for my monthly community service announcement. For those people who are interested, the Facilities Committee is scheduled to meet on Thursday, March 2nd at 7.30 a.m. The Finance Committee is scheduled to meet on Tuesday, March 14th at 4.30 p.m., the next regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting will be held on Monday, March 20th at 7 o'clock p.m. As Vonda shared in her superintendent's report, board members are reminded that the board will hold a board retreat that will be conducted in two parts. Please make certain board members that your calendar is marked for Tuesday, March 28th and Thursday, March 30th from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. All of you can expect to receive agendas for these sessions from our retreat facilitators, Mary Broderick and Jack Reynolds. So that, that will be coming um, prior to the retreat at the end of March. Also, please note um, that each board member has received information via email from Town Clerk Stephanie Charleglio regarding a Freedom of Information workshop given by Public Information Officer of the State of Connecticut, Tom Hennick, on Tuesday, March 21st, from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. in the Town Hall main meeting room. And um, each of you are being asked to respond directly to Stephanie Charleglio, town clerk, indicating whether or not you will be attending that meeting. So please note that in your email. That's it for um, community service announcements. Uh, we're moving on to agenda item five, public comment. I'm going to ask once again if there's anyone who wishes to make a public comment to please raise their hand in the participants list. I've scrolled twice and I don't see anyone. Maria, do you see anyone? No, I don't. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving on to 5B, um, I'm going to ask that the board go into executive session to discuss potential claims and litigation, inviting the superintendent and the director of business services and operations to join the board. Um, I don't expect, for the general public, I don't expect any action to be taken when the board returns to public session um, the only action that would be taken is an adjournment. Um, do I have a motion from uh, the someone on the board to move into executive session, inviting uh, Superintendent Tenza and um, Donna Coonan? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Jeff. And do I have a second? 
Mike, I see your hand. Thank you. All right. Um, Maria, taking the vote. Yes. Sarah Beth? Yes. Jay? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Mike? Yes. Stephen? Yes. Brooke? Yes. And I vote yes. That's unanimous. Board members, if you go to your email, there's a link for executive session um, that you will find in your email from Vonda. Um, those of you who have signed in for tonight and might be leaving, um, have a pleasant evening. Thank you for joining us. Be safe in the snow tomorrow. And I'll see board members. Anthony, thank you for everything. I see you waving. Jimmy, thank you. Carrie, thank you. Lisa, thank you. Have a good night, everyone.